on the 7th of October, 2023. The world stopped having an alibi, the alibi of not knowing what is happening in the ancient land of Palestine. The Western media, our governments, the Zionist lobby, uh, have uh, uh, expended enormous effort to distort the historical significance of the 7th of October, to present it as a massacre of Israelis, as um, um, a war crime and nothing but, uh, as if the Gaza Strip was a country that suddenly attacked another country, a member nation, a member state of the United Nations. Uh, any clearly thinking person, independently of whether they support the Palestinian cause or not, should be able, as long as they have even the most slight of uh, commitments to international law and to logic, to separate the act of resistance of bringing down that hideous fence, which is not a fence separating these countries, but it is a fence defining the... Um, perimeter of the largest uh, open-air prison in the world, separate this act of not only legitimate resistance, but if you have been encased unlawfully in an open-air prison camp, you not only have the right to bring down that fence and to attack anyone who is guarding it and ensuring <laughs> that you are fenced in, but you have a duty to do this. So we need to separate this act of resistance, any war crimes committed by those who resisted. So let me be absolutely clear on this. Breaking down a fence that is part of your concentration camp uh, to, and whose intention, the intention of that fence is to deny you and your people basic human rights and to effectively cause the population within the descendants of refugees to wither uh, through malnutrition, through disease, through maybe emigration if they are allowed to leave. Uh, this resistance is a duty. In sharp contrast, violating civilians or abducting them, uh, that is a war crime. And international law must uh, condemn war crimes wherever they happen, for whatever reason they happen. That, this is why yesterday, to mark the anniversary, uh, Brian, Brian Nino and myself, we wrote to the judges of the criminal court, uh, effectively saying that uh, back in January, when we heard that uh, the court uh, on which the judges sit had decided to hear the case, uh, we were encouraged, mildly encouraged, because humanity needs an international criminal court that upholds the rule of law and the principles that are outlined at the beginning. Uh, and However, we also reminded the judges that since January, uh, all matters regarding events in the Gaza Strip, in Gaza, are beyond dispute. We told them that Israel's government has set out to eliminate, systematically to eliminate, every aspect of Palestinian life. We've seen the most intensive bombing of a densely populated urban area in living memory. We've seen the most deliberate starvation of a population since the Second World War, at least. We've seen the systematic destruction of health facilities. Uh, schools were attacked, universities, libraries, archives, cultural centers, mosques, churches, heritage sites, professors and teachers were killed, uh, doctors and nurses, along with their patients and their, in the case of um, educational establishments, uh, their pupils and their students, entire families being on the grounds. Uh, and of course, while this was happening under the cover of the conflict in Gaza, Israeli settlers continued to do what Israel, Israeli settlers were doing since 1948, uh, protected by IDF soldiers, that is, evict Palestinians from their ancestral homeland, from their homes, um, as part of an uh, uh, eight-decade-old almost uh, process of ethnically cleansing, uh, a slow-burning genocide, which in the last year has become a very fast uh, accelerating genocide. Uh, and we told them, the judges, that these are not just violations of the government. We can see that what the Knesset has done, it is essentially with uh, 65 votes to nine, ignored the International Court of Justice ruling that uh, the occupied territories are unlawfully occupied. 
here you have uh, effectively a whole regime which is hell-bent on uh, violating international law. It's been doing it now for many decades. And what we've seen you know, on the 7th of October in 2023 is that if you cage people and you treat them like, like animals, what do you expect? There is going to be an uprising and there will be violence and there will be war crimes. We do not justify the war crimes. We want the International Criminal Court to prosecute all war crimes independently of who committed them because international law either applies to everyone or it applies to no one. Uh, having said that, let us know, move beyond the, the use of... Uh, uh, logic and law in order to argue for the Palestinians. Let us now look at ourselves as the, uh, the sub as supporters of the Palestinian people, as uh, citizens of the world who know that unless Palestine is free, we are not going to be free. Robert Fisk, the great journalist who used to write for the Independent, once said that unless Palestine becomes free, the American people will not be free. What, and you understand the repercussions of that. I think it's it's important to take stock of the situation. Uh, I may upset some of you by saying that um, I don't agree with uh, the chant that I also chant when I, I'm in demonstrations that Palestine will be necessarily free. Uh, this is the goal. But I think it is a very big mistake to take it for granted that we will win. And I'm saying this because uh, what is happening in Israel, in Palestine, since 1948, is a white settler enterprise. It's a white settler racist apartheid process of eliminating a people and replacing them with white settlers. Uh, I have friends and, um, you know, lots of people write to me and say, but how can the United States continue to support Israel? How can Britain continue to support Israel after the last year of atrocity being added upon atrocity? How can, you know, Germany and France do that? The answer is, how can they not do that? You see, what is happening in the ancient land of Palestine, has been tried and tested by these powers. What is the United States? It's a white settler project. Initially, it was on the East Coast, 13 little poor and decrepit uh, colonies, uh, set up mainly by the British, but containing many Europeans, uh, which turned into superpower through violence and through ethnic cleansing. They moved to the West, they killed the whole of the population. They essentially established the pattern that um, you declare a land to be free of people, terra nullius, as the British did in Australia. When the British went to Australia, they looked at 5 million Aborigines and they said, okay, these are not people. So this is a land without people. So it's a land of, without people for a people without a land. That is for the convicts and everybody else who was going to come from Britain and colonize Australia. And they killed the Aboriginal people. You know, there were five and a half million. How many of them are left now? Similarly, what is happening with Native Americans? They have been obliterated. And the ones who are remaining stay in Bantustans, called reservations. That is what Netanyahu wants to do. But it's not also only what Netanyahu wants to do. This is why it's important not to focus our... Criticism on Netanyahu. It's what Ben Gurion wanted, the first Israeli prime minister. And how do I know that? Because he told us so uh, in uh, a fascinating discussion with um, a historian, um, Nahum Goldman, I believe was his name. Um, and this is verbatim. I've got it here. I'm reading it off my screen. Uh, Nahum Goldman quotes Ben Gurion in a conversation they had saying the following. Ben Gurion said, if I was an Arab leader, I would never make terms with Israel. That is natural. We have taken their countries. <laughs> sure, God promised it to us. But what does it matter to them? That's Ben Gurion talking about the Palestinians. Our God, the Jewish God, is not theirs. We come from Israel. It's true. But that was 2,000 years ago. And what is it to them? Yes, there's been anti-Semitism, the Nazis, Hitler, Auschwitz. 
but was that their fault? <laughs> That's, you know, Ben Gurion. I, I, I repeat this. It is Ben Gurion saying that. They only see one thing. They've come here and stolen their country. Why should they accept that? They may perhaps forget this in one or two generations' time. That's what Ben Gurion was hoping. But how can they accept it when this, the, the land theft continues to this day? The concentration camp in Gaza continues to this day. How can they possibly forget it? And then he continues. Uh, so it's simple, he says. We have to stay strong and maintain a powerful army. And what did he mean by staying strong? I think that there was another moment in 1956, in April 1956, when uh, the answer was given by another prominent Israeli, uh, Ben Gurion, so the time chief of staff, Moshe, Moshe Dayan, who later became the defense minister. And much, much later, uh, during the Oslo negotiations, he was the foreign minister of Israel. Uh, sometime in April um, 1956, uh, um, an Israeli settler, very close to the Gaza fence, uh, was uh, killed, shot, dead, by a Palestinian uh, fighter who had crossed the border, the border, not the border, the fence, and killed that settler. And uh, Moshe Dayan made a point of going to his funeral. And he said, he said, let us, and here I'm quoting again, that's Moshe Dayan saying, let us not hurl blame at the murderers. Why should we complain of their hatred for us? Eight years, this is Moshe Dayan talking about the Palestinians of Gaza. Eight, that is 1956. Eight years they've sat in the refugee camps of Gaza and seen with their own eyes how we have made a homeland of the soil of the villages where they and their forebears once dwelt. Not from the Arabs of Gaza must we demand the blood of Roy, the dead man, but from ourselves. So effectively what he's saying is that, you know, but this is what we do. We are settlers. So we need to keep killing them until we get rid of them. Otherwise, um, don't blame them for attacking us because this is what we would do if we were them. Uh, the, the, this, this, this is critical. Uh, and let me, uh, so as not to speak for much longer, uh, Turn to today, because everything I've said so far is an attempt to, 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 to demonstrate that what is happening is the natural, logical extension of what has been happening since 1948. It's a white settler imperialist colonial project. What did we, did, did we expect? The moment the West is continuing to arm these white settlers, you know, if, if, if the West continued to arm uh, the Boers, the white supremacists ruling apartheid South Africa, Nelson Mandela would have died in jail. And there would have been no overthrow of apartheid. Now, let us not fall in love with our success to defeat South African apartheid. Uh, because, comrades, I'm going to again sadden you by saying that the two are similar in terms of you have two apartheid states, South Africa and, and Israel, but they differ in one important respect. The white supremacists in South Africa needed black labor, black proletarian labor. Without black proletarian labor, their mines and their factories could not function. Uh, once upon a time, the Israeli apartheid system also needed Palestinian labor, but no longer especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the mass migration of uh, Jews from uh, the Soviet Union in East Germany to, 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 um, to Israel, uh, and with the economic growth in Israel, two things happened. Firstly, the proletarian population from Eastern Europe uh, grew, so they could replace the Palestinians who were crossing the Green Line to work in Israel proper, in pre-1967 Israel. And the second thing that would happen was that Israel, Israeli, the Israeli bourgeoisie was rich enough to import Filipinos, people from Thailand, and so on and so forth. And you saw some people who were abducted and killed on the 7th of October from those parts of the world. So this is, the, you know, so allow me to be very brutal, but to make a logical point. Um, 
the white supremacists in South Africa, uh, if they press, if they could press a button and eliminate, and eliminate all the blacks from South Africa, they wouldn't because they needed them. The Israeli supremacists, uh, they would press it. They would press it because they they don't really need the, the, the Palestinian proletarian labor anymore. This is why our struggle to bring down Israeli apartheid is much harder than the struggle to bring down South African apartheid. Um, and one last thought, and I'll close with that. I appeal to everyone, not amongst our panel, but to people who are listening, <laughs> whoever is listening. I'm appealing to all of you. Do not allow yourselves to be sidetracked by Western media who take the bait very willingly. Maybe it's not even a bait for them. Maybe they are part of the propaganda of latching on to the escalation of this uh, killing, mass killing, killing spree of the Israeli army into Lebanon, into Yemen, possibly into Iran. And there is an escalation. And, you know, there's nothing that Western commentators love less, sorry, love more, love more than making, turning this into a large geopolitical discussion. You know, now that we've moved beyond Gaza and Iran and nuclear weapons and maybe Russia and maybe China are coming in, what does this mean for Europe? Does it, what does it mean for the world? It's a mistake. Firstly, it doesn't mean anything for Europe. The war in Ukraine is a clear and present threat to European interests and European security. But the war in Israel-Palestine is con fully contained. Why is it fully contained? Because you have the complete, the complete domination and hegemony of the United States as exercised through the Arab states, not only through Israel, but all the Arab states are complicit. Every single one of them surrounding Jordan, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, the remember the Abraham Accords, all the way to Morocco. They are all in the pocket of Israel and the United States, every single one of them. The King of Jordan may kick and scream about what's happening to the Palestinians, but he gets his party line straight from, the, from Washington, D.C. Yeah? Lebanon is, has been destroyed a long time ago. It doesn't exist as a state. Right? So... Even if you, even if you know Iran had nuclear weapons, Iran is not stupid enough to use them, and I don't think Israelis are stupid enough to use them either. So the whole discussion about escalation and nuclear weapons and what, it's all besides the point. It is all noise. This is what Netanyahu is doing. He's expanding, escalating the war so that we talk about nuclear weapons, about Iran, about South Lebanon, rather than the real issue, which is the genocide of Palestinians in Gaza, in East Jerusalem, and in the West Bank. So what is absolutely essential for us is to keep focusing, you know, with laser vision on what's happening in Gaza, in East, Jeru in East Jerusalem, and in uh, uh, the West Bank. What's happening to Lebanon is, of course, very significant for the people of Lebanon. Uh, what's happening in Yemen is significant to the people of Yemen. But we'll discuss all this after Palestine is free. Is free. And it's not guaranteed that it will be free. We must not, you know, sound stupid by saying that there is a historical process which inevitably will yield a good outcome. Talk to the Aborigines in Australia. It didn't happen. Took the, talk to the Native Americans in um, the United States. It did not happen. They were not freed. They will forever remain slaves of a white settlement project. That is why we are agents. History will not do it for us. We all have to work to make sure that this is not another defeat of humanism.